Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. In a couple of months' time, Australians will go to the polls. There has never been a more important election. At a time when Australia needs certainty, Mr Albanese, the most extreme left Labor MP to ever lead the Labor Party, would be a risk to our economy and our security. So what has Mr Albanese stood for? Just consider his record. A carbon tax, a mining tax, congestion tax, higher super taxes, higher income taxes, a housing tax, a retirees tax, a family business tax and an inheritance tax. And even today, after a track record in supporting higher taxes on retirees, housing and incomes, he has failed to rule out higher taxes on Australian family businesses. As part of the Rudd-Gillard government, he has supported unwinding Australia's strong border protections. Under Mr Albanese's leadership, Labor has voted against laws to help deport foreign nationals who commit violent crimes. Mr, Mr Albanese would be too weak to stand up to the Greens, the unions or even Mr Shorten, and too weak to stand up for Australia's national interests. Just consider the Labor left, particularly in Victoria, it's, it's incorrect, absolute yeah. profound yeah. failure to oppose Daniel Andrews' insidious Belt and Road Agreement. I say shame on Mr Albanese and shame on the members for Corangamite, Bendigo and Ballarat, amongst others. Mr Albanese is a weak leader who does not know what he stands for. On major policy issues like JobKeeper and income tax relief, he flip-flops and cannot stick to a position. Mr Albanese and Labor even flip-flopped on their only major policy in response to the pandemic, a plan to spend around $6 billion to pay every person $300 to get a vaccine. Just imagine if he had control of the Treasury. Mr Albanese and Labor have no plan for our economy and no plan to keep Australians safe. He's certainly not resonating in the federal electorate of Corangamite. I can report very reliably that the lacklustre and ineffective current Labor MP, when visiting the chicken shop in Ocean Grove, told a local resident that she understood that Mr Albanese was not well liked and was in fact a real problem. New government estimates have revealed that Labor policies announced during the pandemic would have equated to an additional $81 billion in COVID spending. This would have led to a major blowout in the budget bottom line. And just consider the, the risks of a Labor-Greens alliance, because I say to all Australians, that's what you will get if Labor is elected. The true cost of the Greens' reckless proposal to put a moratorium on mining, coal, gas and oil is staggering. A moratorium that Anthony Albanese will need to indulge on the other side of the election if he wishes to form government. We have seen it before and we will see it again. Figures confirm that if the Greens get their way and force Labor down this path in a hung parliament, at least 80,000 jobs are being put at risk, 50,000 in construction, 30,000 in ongoing employment across the country, as well as more than half a trillion dollars of investment in local communities right across Australia. The resources and energy sector con contributed just over $35 billion in royalties and company tax in the latest last year's figures. So if we take those billions away, it's up to Labor and the Greens to tell us which schools, which hospitals and which pensioners will be hit and where funding will be lost and taken. Of the projects in the pipeline across the country, 185 billion are directly contributing to lowering emissions, hydrogen, ammonia and carbon capture and storage projects. The Greens policies are so short-sighted. Killing off investment in the resources sector will also impact our aim to reach net zero by 2050. Gas in particular will play a critical role as we transition to a lower emissions future. And we all know and have heard that the member for Corangamite has absolutely rejected gas. So as I say, the Labor-Greens alliance is bad for jobs, bad for investment, bad for the budget, and bad for any ambitions to reach net zero. I say to all Australians, at the next election, don't risk Labor. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Chikane. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and it's uh, great to be in the chamber. Hopefully, it's the last speaker for the evening amongst uh, some really close colleagues of mine here. So, buckle in for the next five minutes. Mr. President, it's no secret that regional Australians have been doing it tough under the coalition. Through fire and flood, through a global pandemic, through significant supply chain issues and severe worker shortages, our farmers have been struggling. But we need to ask questions. Why have they been struggling? Why have they been struggling on their own? That's because the Liberal and National parties have abandoned regional Australia. While farming communities have been crying out for support, the only thing that the Morrison-Joyce government has delivered them is a press conference after press conference. Unfortunately, this week, we, what we have seen are many, many of examples of the approach of this government and their attitude towards our farmers. The challenges that are facing regional Australia continues, yet the Liberals and the Nationals are only focused on themselves. Maybe instead of sending nasty text messages to each other, this government could get its head out of the sand and actually take note of some of the real serious issues on the ground that are being faced by Australians right across our regions. It's been two years since the terrible bushfire season that ravaged so harshly and so much of our country right through eastern Australia, particularly in regional areas. But it was reported last year that the Morrison-Joyce government only delivered and set aside 1.6 per cent of its grants program for East Gippsland, where 1.1 million hectares of land was burnt. This inequitable uh, distribution of funds has meant that many, many people in the East Gippsland region have gone without assistance that they desperately need and deserve. And that's not all, Mr President. In October last year, it was revealed that of the $4.7 billion that this government promised for bushfire recovery, zero, that's right, zero dollars had been spent. This is just unbelievable. Australians lost everything in the bushfires. Their homes were destroyed. Their lives were turned upside down. But what support do they get from the Liberals and the Nationals? A press conference announcing money that never arrives from a government that never delivers. And it's because the Morrison-Joyce government refuses to do its job. Australian families are living in caravans. That's right, caravans. They've suffered through COVID restrictions, health risks and economic damage, while still waiting for their houses to be rebuilt. But this government is all about announcements and no follow-through. It's all about having very real, very severe consequences on the lives of these many, many Australians who are begging the government, the federal government, to do something and support them. But bushfire relief is just one area where the Liberals and Nationals have let regional Australians down. For years, farmers have been crying out for labour certainty. There has been headline after headline inquiry after inquiry, report after report about worker shortages in regional Australia, about pro producing many, many fresh vegetables and fruit. But they're all going unpicked because they just can't find people to come on their farms. And these issues haven't just magically appeared, but they've also gotten worse whilst we've had the pandemic over the last two years. So how has the Morrison-Joyce government helped our farmers with this issue? They've flip-flopped on the agriculture visa. Yes, the ag visa, which they promised almost four years ago. That's right. As regional Australia has been desperate for certainty, this government has changed its position on the ag visa at least half a dozen times, and it's becoming hard to keep up. After flip-flopping for years, the Morrison-Joyce government finally launched an ag visa program about six months ago. But how many countries have signed up to this program, you might ask? Well, the answer is simple. It's zero. Zero, Mr President. In the Warnable stand last week, we've had vegetable growers express disappointment in the program. They are mortified that this government has let them down 
and the farmers down right across regional Australia. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. And I hate to steal your thunder, but I'm actually going to add a few remarks this evening before we finish tonight. I wish to pay tribute to the many, many volunteer fighter fi firefighters in Western Australia who have spent the last week, in some cases more, fighting a number of bushfires across my home state, um, particularly in that part of, the, of Western Australia, which I know so well, the southwest. Uh, there have been significant fires uh, across the southwest, uh, particularly in the electorate of O'Connor, the electorate of my good friend Rick Wilson. Uh, but in particular, there was uh, a devastating fire around Wickerpen, which uh, another one of my good friends, uh, Steve Martin, MLC, member of the Upper House in Western Australia, was directly involved in fighting. Steve is one of the many, many volunteers who fought the Wickerpen fire. His brigade, the wonderfully country-named 10 Mile to 86 Gate Brigade, uh, spent the night battling a terrific blaze. The words Steve said to me was, I don't want to fight another fire like that. Uh, brigades came from all around the local area, from Kubaling, Narragin, from Wickerpen, from Yeelaring, Harrismith, Dumbleyung, Wagen, Highbury and Tincurran. Uh, volunteers, volunteers with the support of, of many professionals as well, uh, over a terrible night, they did get the fire under control, uh, but I think it's good to recognise the efforts of our volunteers, particularly our bush firefighting volunteers, uh, the amazing efforts they put in every summer. So I would personally like to thank them all. And on that note, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30am. <laughs>